Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Bazelli's Wine TV. This is our first show of 2022, very stoked. Ryan and I and Holly have a lot planned for you this year. Very excited, as you may know, I'm Mike Bazelli, your host. Today we have Eric Platt of Arts and Vines, already out the gate, first show in the new year. We're meeting, and we're, we're already doing a first, we're meeting with an importer. We've never met with an importer before. <laughs> This is really cool. We know a lot about the distribution side of the business. You saw us tour um, RNDC's huge Virginia Fulfillment Center. But uh, we want to know more about the importing side of the business. And so that's why we invited Eric. Not to mention, Eric um, also distributes. So, and um, he rep represents a lot of great wines, particularly a couple by our friends uh, Mario and Anne Monticelli. Um, ma uh, massive, amazing winemakers out of California. Um, so we'll be tasting some wine from them today. Another first, we're also going to be tasting a French wine today. I've never tasted a French wine on the show. So um, uh, like you guys, I'm trying to develop my palate. And our theme, of course, is this is not the Cali Cab show. We want to broaden your palates. We don't want to disparage anybody, any Cali Cab producers, but we are sensitive to the vineyard teams out there that are working hard every day, Eric. But I'm uh, really excited for you to join us. Thanks for taking the time. I always start the show with asking, how'd you get in the business? How'd you end up with Arts and Vines? Really stoked. You're an importer. Love to hear it. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Michael. It's, uh, it's good to be here. You know, I, uh, my first job in the business was a busboy uh, at Congressional Country Club. And I actually sell, I sell them wine now, which is, which is kind of funny. Full circle. Full circle. So, so, you know, from the age of 15, working in restaurants for about eight years, got to a fork in the road, stay in the restaurant side of it, or I had an opportunity to get into wholesale. So I started in wholesale um, at the age of 23, you know, a few moons ago. And then from there, I just kind of... Uh, just my career kind of just took different... Uh, Is that wholesaler still around today? No, the, the wholesaler then was called Milton S. Kronheim Company. They ended up merging with uh, a company called Foreman Brothers, and I think today they would be part of what's known as RNDC. Republic so National. I do remember Foreman Brothers, so a few moons, moons ago. I'm yep. not too far behind you, probably on the <laughs> same, probably the same amount of moons. Yep. But I did not know about the Milton guys. Yeah, okay. he, was, he was quite, I mean, a lot of the guys that got into wholesale back in the day were, uh, were bootleggers. You know that were, uh, you know, during prohibition, were uh, were still getting booze because everybody wanted booze. And then when booze became legal again, they were all set up. You know, so Milton S. Kronheim was one of the famous uh, bootleggers back in the day. That yeah, makes absolutely. sense. I didn't know that little huge knowledge bomb, guys. Thanks for sharing, Eric. Um, distributors started out as bootleggers. They had the infrastructure, and it was an easy transition <laughs> Some for of them. them. Did yeah, and, and that's pretty cool. You it's know, American history there. Yeah. So we, we appreciate history. And um, you said you you then migrated from where after? So I went from wholesale selling to restaurants for this big company. Wine at that point was, was still in its uh, infancy. You know, it was a lot of spirits. It was a lot of beer. We did Heineken and Amstel. Uh, from there, I went into, um, I wanted to get into management. So I got into beer, worked for the premium house in DC in management, then I went into retail for a number of years, and then I went back into wholesale at the management level for a company called International, which uh, also got swallowed up in you know, different uh, distributor takeovers and so forth. I first got into the importing side of it in 97. I got a job with a very famous French importer named Bobby Catcher. Uh, who was working with small growers throughout France. It's like a Kermit Lynch yes, kind of guy? Yes, exactly. Okay. Very much like that. Um, Kermit Lynch is, how would you describe them, Eric? I would say he was a pioneer in bringing uh, to America small producers from, from Europe, especially, and, and Bobby Catcher kind of followed that. But bringing uh, in small, good producers. Small, good producers, and great value, too. Great value, well, too. I would say Kermit Lynch had some value, but it was great producers. Bobby was one of the first to really look for value, great value, you know. Um, so I stayed in the importing side for a while, but really, I don't want to take too much time about my career, but I had an opportunity to buy into an existing import company called Artisans and Vines in March of 16. 
and it was a company that was started in 2009, had had some good success, but then had run into various challenges. And so I was able to buy in in March of 16, invest a little bit of capital, but basically just take my experience and help you know, re-energize and reformulate what we were doing. No, we love the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, you know, we're, we're restaurant guys, pizza guys, um, definitely yeah. self-made. So, so we definitely appreciate that. Um, and then you, so what are some of the hoops and hurdles you jump through as an importer as opposed to a distributor? Well, there's a lot of things, you know, so we, so now we do business from 2016 to now, we do business in 20 states. Um, and then more recently, and how we got connected, we started our own distribution uh, about two and a half years ago. So we do that for the DC and the Maryland region. But as importers, I think one of the biggest challenges is there's so much good wine out there. That's number one. Um, so you can easily become a collector. You know, I'm getting emails, Michael, almost every day from people from all over, all over the world, especially Europe, and they, you know, maybe they've heard about you, you get on a list, or somebody recommended you, and you start getting emails. You know, I would love to talk to you guys, would love to talk every day, you know, so, and there's great wines out there, but you have to be very selective in, you know, obviously, you know, do you have a theme? Do you have uh, a style that you're working with, types of producers? So there's just a lot of things that- Checklists. A lot of checklists that we, you know, we look for, Great wines. We look for uh, you know really good prices. Wines that over deliver. Um, we also want to work with good people. You know, I mean that's that's a I'm just like you. You know, if you know somebody can have great wine uh, at great prices, great packaging, very important in this day and age marketing. But if they're not nice, do we need it? And then the other thing is um, you know terms. You know, are they? Are they flexible as we're introducing new products to the market? Will they work with us at the beginning? Are they going to support you with a sample budget? Yeah, all of these things come into play when you're, you're developing these relationships. This is very interesting, guys. This is a must-watch show for anyone that wants to get into the wine business. I mean, Eric is giving you a business 101 or Harvard education <laughs> in like five minutes. Uh, I, I just learned a lot, and uh, I'm going to be definitely talking about this this interview later, and we're going to follow up later yeah. too because the business of wine is so interesting. But like I said, there's so much good juice out there. It's 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 fascinating. It's fascinating, and we, you know, we tend to, you know, there's there's a number of people we work with already, and sometimes they might say, "Hey, I've got something new," and we'll probably take a priority to look at that first, or sometimes somebody might say, "Hey, you know." you should talk to our neighbor or our friend. And mm -hmm. sometimes that you know, takes priority and we'll at least look at that. Um, but, um, you know, and then certainly the challenges of an importer, one of the biggest challenges is we can import, but then how do we get the product to the marketplace? That's, that's one of the biggest challenges. The last mile. Yeah, and we were yeah. talking about you know, how you can become a collector. Okay, I can become an importer and I can have a warehouse full of wines but now I have to find distributors around the country. You know, it's like producer, importer, distributor, retailer, restaurateur, consumer. You know, and, and we, we're fortunate to have good distributors in parts of the country, but as I was telling you, the challenges in the local market uh, really pushed us in their direction. We have to do this ourselves. So that's why locally we've created our own distribution. You know, awesome. so that we can actually take our whole book and put it into distribution. And for our friends and partners locally, now we have a whole book to sell, at least in the local market, where in like Chicago, maybe only part of our book is available because that's all that distributor needs or wants at this time. And when you're doing your due diligence, okay, of these wines, I know all your wines are, are immaculate. Which, which one is in the 90 point, point plus club? For sure. So I would say, I think the, the three reds that I brought are pretty special. Um, and these would be, these would be. Um, now, were these in the 90 point plus cup before you decided, decided to sign them up? Or how, how did that work? It was like the chicken and the egg kind of question. So, so these were, all of these producers were existing producers that had good press uh, history with them already before they found us. Um, 
jump to the middle one. So this is actually a Nebbiola from Italy, and this is made by our mutual friend, Anna Maria Monticelli. Great people. Yeah, now we get this out of, uh, even though it's Italian, we bring it in from their California operation. So that's where we get it from. Um, so they were already in existence, already getting good PR. They heard about us. We were looking for some good. 92 points. Yep. We were looking for some good wines. Um, we were working with their domestic wines, Tether, which I know you're familiar with, which is also a 90 plus wine, and Stackhouse. That was the first wine I ever bought from you was Tether. Yeah. Because I yeah. love the space theme. Yeah. Kudos, uh, Mario and Ann. So. Yeah, so, so, you know, when we were looking for some Italian wines, Anna Monticelli said, you know, we do some Italian. And so that's how we found that. Trombetta is a very small producer from Sonoma that makes Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. They were in the market before with a wholesaler that they were unhappy with, so they had the pedigree. They were just looking for a new, new representation. That's how we found them. Chateau Fontaloupe was never in this market before, but is, was being imported in other parts of the country by somebody else. So they found us, heard about us, um, so we now are the importer for Chateau de Fontaloupe, one of the premium um, Chateau Neuf de Pop producers. This is southeast France, Grenache-based. Um, and we do this brand not just locally, but for about 15 states. So some of these, some of our imported goods, like the white that we'll try, we have for the whole country. Some we have for part of the country. And that's just a relationship should we start yeah. with this French, the tasting? We can, we can, we can go any way you want. With the Grenache. I did, so this is my first French tasting. I'm not a French wine guy. I'm partial to Italian wines. Eric knows that. I'm not a Cali Cab guy, that's for sure. But <laughs> Grenache, French, I don't see the connection. Am I missing something there? Or is that, is that unusual? For Grenache? For, 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 no. for a French wine? No, it's, it's actually very common. It is. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a grape that needs um, a lot of sun, a lot of heat, a lot of warmth. And the southern part of France has that. So it's, it's been there for quite a long time. Uh, this producer has vines that go back 100 years old and still producing great fruit. So let's give it a try. Oh, absolutely. Looking forward to it. My first French tasting, guys. This is the challenges with the Corvin. Sometimes you need to the Corvin. Put, in, put in more gas. Robert Parker says it's the best invention ever. <laughs> Why don't you give it a try while I put in more gas into the no problem, no into problem. my machine. Should we let French wines decan or air um, oxidize a little? Oh, it can, it can, it should be ready to go. It does, it does smell ready to go. Um, what so this is going to be Grenache. Beautiful bouquet. Yeah. I, wow. And this is female uh, owned. Well, it's uh, Anne Charlotte. She owns this with her husband and she's the winemaker. Wow. So we also work with a lot of, uh, I'm sure you're, your viewers are quite interested in, uh, you know, the movement with, with yeah, female. female empowerment, um, black ownership, of course, two big um, themes of ours that, that are, 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 are not themes, but um, movements, like you said, that we, that we strongly try to support when, when we can. Um, Let's give that amazing nose. There we go. So this is predominantly Grenache. Secondary grape would be Syrah. Spends about over 12 months in French oak barrels. Just beautiful, beautiful wine. I think this Syrah is where the finesse comes. Grenache gives it, you know, sort of the power and the richness. And you're right, the Syrah kind of softens it up a little bit, gives it that little backbone. Let's give it a sip. What would, you, what would you eat with this? What would be your pick? So this is very versatile. You could eat anything with this. It's very versatile. Um, initially on the palate, it's a little bit of a fruit bomb. I guess the Grenache talking there. Yeah. But it's got that soft, old world finish. Not too tannic. No, no. And it's got, it's got some great earthy textures, some spiciness to it. I like this with, um, you know, something on the grill. You know, maybe a big, 
Uh, anything, Eric. Uh, this is so of delicious. The anything. Ice yeah. cream, bananas, uh, grilled salmon, <laughs> whatever you it want. It could work with salmon, yes. especially if you spiced up that salmon yeah. a little bit. Yeah, it's, it, it needs something after, now that it's, it's been on my palate, Urban, uh, uh, now that I've been enjoying it for a few more moments on my palate, I would probably um, enjoy something spicy, something high on the Scoville Index with this. Yeah, so um, very famous producer. She also makes, uh, um, uh, it's called uh, Pou Roland. It's uh, old vine Grenache, and it's 100% Grenache. And then she also makes Cote d'Arone red, Cote d'Arone white. So pretty interesting property. Hey, uh, touchdown for my first French wine tasting uh, at all. I, I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> touchdown. <Boom. down>. Touchdown. <laughs> Go France. Uh, big fan of Mbappe that plays with PSG right now. So this is very uh, oh, yeah. very nice. I like that guy. Yeah, I love Mbappe. So this is to you, Mbappe. Keep scoring. <laughs> Okay, so and I guess we will uh, try Mario and Anne's Yeah, we might as Nebbiolo. well. We might as well work backwards. There you go. So Anna and Mario, um, we were introduced to them in California, and more recently introduced to their Italian stuff. And this is their Monticelli Langi Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo. So this is from Piedmonte, the foot of the mountain. Yeah. So it's going to be a little lighter in color, but it's got a lot of richness and depth. It's got 50% Barolo in it, which is interesting. So one yeah, of the Barolo is probably like Barolo, Brunello, any of those, I'm, I'm sold. Yeah. <laughs> and then Nebbiolo. And then Nebbiolo. So 100% Nebbiolo. Uh, what makes this such a reasonable, I mean, it's got the 90 plus points, what makes it so reasonable is, remember that there's Barolo and Barbaresco, the, you know, the, the regions, the towns. Langley is just outside of that. It's almost like saying, you know, Crystal City instead of all of Arlington, a little more specific. So this being just outside that boundary gives it an incredible value. It has such a rich nose, totally different than that French Grenache. That's right, that we just that's right. Had. Well, it's, yeah. I, I, I smell some cheese. Mm. So a lot of character. Wow. Salud to Mario and Ann. Another gem. Keep doing, to keep doing the great stuff. Yeah, another gem. Wow. Very get, good Nebbiolo. Yeah. We get a couple other Italians from them, a Pecorino, which is very interesting, and also um, a Vermentino from Tuscany. Wow. 12 months in Slovenian oak. Six months in the bottle. Okay, so a lot of uh, TLC goes into this. That's right, and look how many cases are produced. Only 400 cases, people. When we're talking limited production, that's highly limited production. Or that's, that's like a contradiction in terms, highly limited. But <laughs> Um, Highly limited. Yeah, extremely, extremely limited. limited. Thank extremely you, Eric. Limited. That's why we have Eric on the yes. show. Extreme 400 cases. How many do you have left for me? <laughs> as many as you want. Now, wow. you, know, you know what's interesting, Michael? I mean, it's, it's a very good point. And I think, you know, for your viewers, you know, they don't always understand what that means, 500 cases. So, you know, for you guys watching, you know, to give you an idea, I used to work with wineries from New Zealand. I'll give me an example. You know, Kim Crawford. Huge. Right? So Kim Crawford is like a factory. They make, and we're not going to say anything about the quality, right? It's like no, we, we, Panera yeah. bread, yeah, right? We, yeah, we it's don't, consistency. Yeah, it's consistency. It's, it's, it's totally great. different product. Totally, totally different. Yeah, Apples yeah. and oranges. Yes. We all like Panera. It has a place wherever you go in the world, it's going to be the same. I'm fine with Panera. They make a good yeah. broccoli cheddar soup. So, yeah. yeah. I love their broccoli <laughs> cheddar soup. But, you know, Kim Crawford will make five million cases, right? Five million. They're cases. making four hundred people. <laughs> so, it's it's like the uh, the chef driven restaurant versus Panera Bread, fifty seat restaurant. You know, it's a different product. It's a different experience. I like to use the word cerebral. It is cerebral. It's a much more cerebral experience. Spiritual, drinking wine. spiritual, cerebral, soulful. Soulful is a I good think, word. I think Mario and Anne probably know every grape. They probably name every grape that goes yeah. into this uh, batch. Um, uh, how many vintages has this been around? 
That's a good question. I don't okay. know if I know the answer to that. I'm going to say, well, the family's been making Nebbiolo-based uh, wines for a number of years. How long it's been available in the United States, I'm going to say, you know, less than five years. So Mario and Ann, their father was chief winemaker at Gallo. Am I correct? Or was a winemaker? I think that is correct. A winemaker That's at Gallo. That's right. And so both of them have worked in a lot of uh, highly acclaimed wineries throughout California as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We actually hosted Mario. That was my, one of my first wine tastings was with Mario Monticelli. I was really spoiled. So, uh, amazing individual. And I think they're both UC Davis grads were all yeah. the... Uh, vino culturists or viticulturists. Yeah. Where all the vit viticulturists are, uh, yeah. they breed viticulturists. Yeah, all viticulturists yep. come out of UC Davis. Um, that's, that's the place. That's the that's place. That's the harbor. Yeah, you got to have that on your resume. You got to yeah. go to UC Davis if you want to be a winemaker. Wow. Um, we have to talk later about how many cases you have and wholesale. Uh, did you check with accounting, Eric? Um, <laughs> yeah, you'll be able to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there's a lot of value in this incredible Nebbiolo. Uh, yeah. Wow, and I love the label. Um, very classy. I always say Italians can't design labels to save their lives, but Italian Americans can. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. It's a little more modern than maybe the traditional Italian. Yeah, they're like you might ethnic see Italians from that area. No, they refuse to like tweak their labels. Like, look at what these Australians are doing. They're yeah. selling wine. Yeah. The road, they're, yeah. They're talking to you, and sorry for jumping to the this white here, but this look, it just it, it's it like jumps. Ele it's electric. Yeah, it, it jumps. jumps. Yeah. It jumps, and it even feels good. It does. It does. Yeah. It's kind of Texture. It does. It's an awesome label. It's, oh, it gets got, back into the marketing thing. We can have another whole conversation about marketing. Oh, I love, love to talk. Like, I, my, another tasting I went to was with Francis Ford Coppola. Eric, the word label was said more than wine in this tasting. Yeah. Who's a man who knows marketing? Visualization, cinema, The Godfather. Yeah, you know this. I how do I don't describe this label? It's like uh, chalky, and you just want to rub it. Uh, this okay, this is a family show, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we we could try the white uh, if you think it's a good idea. Yeah, well, let's you know since we're since we're sticking with red, do you want to? Oh, I'm keep sorry. Going? I'm sorry. Let's. We got one more red. Boom. Yeah, so this is um, this is one of our, you know, when we, I was telling you, when we went from just importing to actually distribution, we needed some domestic products. And that's where, you know, Mario and Anna were able to bring us their wines and also the Italian wines that we buy from them out of California. And then Trombetta also came our way. They had heard about us, that we were, we were starting our own distribution company. And... Um, they were distributed by somebody else locally. They make about 2,500 cases of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from the Gap's Crown, which is a very specific area in um, Sonoma. California. This is Mishma. Oh, no, no, the, I'm sorry. This is actually the Trombetta from California. I'm still fixated on this. And this is where it is. Trombetta from Sonoma Trombetta. County. Yep. And this is, uh, again, woman-owned, woman-run. It's Ricky and Erica Trombetta, so mother and daughter team. Italian-Americans for sure. Yes, absolutely. Maybe they went out looking for gold like the um, Simi family. <laughs> yeah. That's how a lot of Italians got out to California. They were looking for gold. They didn't find any gold, so they decided to make wine. And a good thing they did because it's really good wine. Um, now, wait till you try this. This, this will be Pinot some of the... War. So, Pinot Noir, I understand, Eric, is about to surpass Cabernet as the number one grape in America. It's crazy. You started started with um, with Sideways. Started with Sideways, that movie, cold classic. You think that was the... It was, it was Hollywood, I mean, facilitated this It this seemed movement? to have started it, for sure. You know, and it's, 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 it's a great grape. You know, it's... Um, it's versatile. It's it can be interesting. There's lots of different styles tannic. of it. It's not tannic. No. no, I don't know. See, that's why I don't understand the American fascination with it. It's not tannic. Maybe flavorful. It's flavorful. It's um, it's easier sometimes easier. than Cabernet to drink. Yeah. You know. Mmm. Just smell that, like cherries, of cherries. violets, touch of earthiness to it. This, this is a little world, bubble gum, a little cotton candy too. Yep, this is world class Pinot. I think it is. Let's let's give it a taste. Wow, 
I haven't tasted a Pinot like this. Delicious, different. This is an iconoclast kind of. Yeah, so Erica Trombetta, who's now the winemaker, her, she studied under Paul Hobbs. And I'm sure you know that name. One of the, you know, iconic figures in California, actually world winemaking now, kind of like Anna and Mario, um, you know, traveling the world, helping make wine in different places. You know, Paul Hobbs is certainly an icon in that category. And Erica Trombetta, who's now maybe in her 30s, you know, studied under Paul Hobbs. And that's where she gets her. Trombetta. Um, when we're talking about small producers, how, how many cases of this do you think? 2,500 cases total. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's it. Um, this is a very good Pinot Noir. Um, the, the 2018 vintage, uh, how long is it aged? This spends about um, about twelve months in French barrels as well. Um, Pinot Noir is the hardest, one of the hardest grapes to grow. Yes, we like yeah. to say it's uh, it's very finicky. Um, it only grows in certain places of the world. You know, you need a cooler climate. Um, it's a very thin-skinned grape. You know, finicky like some people. You know, who can be thin-skinned as yeah, well. Yeah, I know right? a few. I know a few. Do you know a few of those. Yeah, I know yep. a few of those. So is that why the valuation may be a little higher? Absolutely. I mean, there's you know, great Pinot only grows in certain places in the world. You know, it's Burgundy in France. It's parts of California, not all of it. It's uh, Oregon, uh, and there's there's other places in the world that are doing some nice Pinot. You know, parts of Australia, New Zealand. Um, Argentina a little bit, but again, you know, you can take a grape like, you know, a hardier grape like Cabernet, Chardonnay, Merlot. A lot of these grapes can grow in a lot of places, but not Pinot. Not Pinot. You know, and to find good Pinot, Michael, you know, you've got to start, the entry level is a little bit higher than it would be for other grapes, for sure. It tastes a little, little lemon. Yeah, like some lemon peel. Some lemon peel. Yep. Zest. Yeah. So if I'm in a restaurant, I, I look at the wine list. If I don't see something that I know or Italian, I order the Pinot. Because I figure this is my rationale. It's the hardest grape to grow. Some love and heart went into this. We hope so. Yes. We hope so. We hope so. Is that, uh, uh, how do you feel about my rationale there? <laughs> um... <laughs> I, because I'm not a cab guy. There's going to be a cab on the menu, but I'm not a cab guy. If I don't see something like a Nebbiolo or a Barolo Brunello or something Primitivo. Vermentino. You know what I do? I, I sometimes go, uh, some wine list used to have a category, category called alternative, alternative reds, alternative whites, things that were different, like red blends. This was like a 1990s thing. Yeah, that's right. What? <laughs> that's this is right. really bad marketing, alternative. <laughs> like, or interesting, interesting it, reds. Or uh, unusual red, something like that. Well, see, that's what the market. So you're giving us a, a taste of what the market was like. Yeah. Back then. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, what was considered alternative or interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think there there are restaurants out there today that are still looking for wines that might be, you know, an interesting blend from, you know, Central California, or you know, we're going to taste this interesting white from. Western Australia that's actually predominantly Riesling, but where do you categorize that on a wine list? Or you just pour it by the glass and call it fantastic, cool, white, interesting white? No, it's a tough one. But your rationale about Pinot isn't a bad one. I think the challenge with Pinot in a restaurant, if you're trying to select a good wine, is Pinots tend to be a little bit higher priced for quality versus you know, price. That's the thing. They start a little bit higher. You know, that's that's the thing. My problem is that I'm not price conscious. So my dad, my dad taught me as an Italian, we live to eat. We don't eat to live. Yeah, I like um, it. I <laughs> so like that's it. what my dad taught me. Yeah. And so I'm not price conscious when it comes to food at all. So that's maybe why Pino, I got Pinot also, I think, uh, appeals to the most people. So if you were with a group of four, six, eight, ten people, I think uh, yeah, it's a crowd pleaser. It is a crowd it, pleaser. It is totally. Yeah. That, 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 that's the what yeah. I was missing there. That's the hook. Yeah, that Pinot is the, the hook. crowd pleaser. Because yeah. Cabernet could be too much for some people. Yeah, right. Too turn, big. Turn off a lot of people. Pinot should crowd pleaser. L lights up the party. Yeah. V very good. V very impressed. The, to the trombettos, cheers, guys. Salute. Well, I could I could feel the love and the warmth in in the, in, the, in that in that 
bottle. And they do come to them, you know, obviously we're dealing with COVID now, but the, the wines that we've tasted so far, all of these producers have been to the DC, Virginia, Maryland market before. And I think once we get past this phase that we're in now, I think there's, there'll be a good opportunity for you to meet all of them. I look forward to it. Um, of course, the open invitation, Eric, to come anytime you like. But uh, pre-COVID, it was my understanding that the DC market was the largest consumer of wine nationally. Per, I think per capita. Per That's capita. Right. Yeah. We're, yeah. Okay. We, we were, okay. That was yeah. the caveat. Yeah. We drink a lot of wine around We here. drink a lot of wine around a here. A lot of stress, a lot of traffic. A lot of, traf <laughs> a lot of traffic. Traffic's getting worse. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's certainly coming back to pre-COVID. Uh, sort of Omicron put a damper on kind of things. But yeah, uh, yeah. We, we're all familiar with traffic in this city. You can't get yeah. anywhere in 20 minutes. Yeah, no. but you know what's interesting? This, this area, you have such a high level of education and, True. and culture. Income. Income. You do have the government, but you have so much, so many other things. Diversity. Incredible diversity, incredible uh, higher education. And so with that comes, you know, as you said, sophistication, interest in food, interest in wine, interest in culture, all the wonderful museums that we have, uh, you know, here for us, all of that stuff. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we probably give spirits a run for their money in this area. Um, yeah, but spirits is huge. Spirits. I was talking to someone the other day. I had a spirits book, and it's just astronomical. But we don't care about that right now. But we are interested in. This is a fuzzy label. This is a fuzzy this is label. This is a fuzzy label. Warm, I warm figured and fuzzy. it out, Ryan. It's not chalky. It's fuzzy. Warm and fuzzy. Really looking forward. I got to say, Michael, I like the direction we did went with the wines. Hey. Sometimes, sometimes going, you know, big red down to. You know, cool white. We're it's easy going. Go. We're easy going middle gonna, class kids, Eric. So yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna give you. A, I'm gonna give you a quick rinse. Clean that out. Always rinse with with the wine and not water. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We don't want to water it down. Little psalm trick. So this is actually from halfway around the world from where we are now. Have you been to Australia? I have not been to my to Australia. My brother has been to Australia, and he's uh, been on that 24 hour flight. I know a few people, a few longtime customers been out to us, just 24-hour flight to get yeah, there. Yeah, it's a pretty special place. I've been fortunate to be there a number of times. To give you an idea of how you get here, so this one is called the Vinovator. It's a mishmash white. It's a blend of dry Riesling, Pinot Gris, and a little bit of Viognier. Now, to get here, we would fly from here to L.A. six hours. A little bit of a layover. We'd go from L.A., to Sydney, Australia, 14 hours. And just when we think we're there, almost there, we're now gonna fly from Sydney to Perth, and that's another five hours. And just when we think we're almost there, we're gonna fly. We're there, we're there, we're there. <laughs> we're gonna fly from Perth to, as they pronounce it, Albany, which is about an hour flight, and this is all Western Australia. And then we're gonna hop in a, a Jeep, and we're gonna drive 30 minutes, and that's where this wine is made, in the great southern Western Australia. you know how Australia. far we went to bring you this <laughs> wine, America? We went far, like really far really to bring far. you this wine. Really, really far. This man, look how far he's been. He just got back. He left in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> I just came We're back. in 2022 now, and he just got back. Uh, and it's delicious. Delicious I, I, wine. I jumped the gun on, on the tasting. But and, you know, it's a little cold outside, but we can drink this and think, you know, it's, it's summertime in Australia right now. And hopefully soon it will be springtime here in Washington, and we'll be enjoying this wonderful wine. Hopefully soon. Delicious blend. Viognier, Riesling, and what's the other grape? Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris, people. Mm, so refreshing, so delicious. So lovely. How about some? Are now you a, I know why you went this far. Are you a shellfish guy? Um, yeah, I am. Today I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not observing hushroot or anything. All right. Okay. Are you a shellfish guy? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sometimes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think yeah. this would be a good wine for that. Some grilled salmon as well. Again, versatile. Anything. It's just good juice. I mean, like we like in Italy, they drink for breakfast. They drink for because the wines are not overpowering. Right. They're subtle. They're simple. Simple but not easy. People, look how far we had to go to get this. Simple but not easy. Yeah. Delicious. 
mishmash. This so you will definitely see on casewinelife.com, along with this Nebbiolo and this Grenache. I mean, was fantastic. Chateau Neuf de Pas. Chateau Neuf de Pas. I mean, give me two. <laughs> and, and the Trombetto family, salute to you guys and all you're doing in Sonoma. Um, so much competition out there and um, we're killing it. Um, this has been an awesome show, Eric. Um, thank you for coming. You have an open invitation to, to come. D let us know before you go out to Australia again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're letting me in right now. So we could time this accordingly. Yeah. But, but really look forward to it. Don't forget to subscribe, smash that like button, share, need the support. 2022 is going to be a big year for Bazzelli's Wine TV. We have so many surprises in store for you. This was just one. Met with an importer. It was my first French wine tasting. Watch this whole puppy. Love you. Salute. Salute.